So we have a second talk here this morning entitled Living the Eucharistic Pattern in Good Times and in Bad. God is good? All the time. And all the time? God is good. I had no idea that was a phrase that you were all familiar with. Yeah. And when you said this morning, I'm like, oh God, you are so clever. <laughs> because this is the first time I've ever titled this talk using Good Times and Bad. I normally just title it Living the Eucharistic Pattern. But I thought, we're at the beginning of a new year. We just looked at, okay, heaven, but what about how we live our life here on earth? Because it's not just, you know, a bed of roses, is it? No, we don't just no. get to skate off into the beautiful uh, Arizona um, sunset. We have good times and bad. So really, is God good all the time? Yes. This is tough. The most common reason I think white people do not believe in God is because of evil. It's because of the bad times. So this is why I wrote the book, When Life Doesn't Go Your Way. Because in my speaking, I experienced people who had experienced the bad times, and instead of walking the way of the cross, they walked away from the cross. It's difficult when you're walking the way of the cross. So how can, how can we live the good times and the bad times knowing deeply, being convicted deeply that God is good? All the time. And all the time? God is good. Even in the bad times? Yes. yes. You're sure? Yes. <laughs> all right, we might know it up here. How do we know it down here in our hearts? So this talk that uh, I'm going to give is in my book, When Life Doesn't Go Your Way. I have 30 copies coming on Monday. But the problem is we live in time, not an eternal now. <laughs> so I don't have them all right now. Um, however, what I've done is I brought with me, in case you know this, took, this talk um, grabs your attention and you want it uh, in print, uh, I, I brought with me some mailing labels. So you are free to pay for it, and I will mail it to you next week when they all arrive uh, at my house. So living the good Eucharistic pattern, in good times and in bad. Who remembers, OK, this is a little sooner than November 1950. Who remembers what we celebrated, October 2004 to October 2005? Month of It was the year of the Eucharist. And it was a marvelous year, if you can remember back. It was, uh, it was just so beautiful to have a year. I wish we would do it again. You know, focused on the Eucharist. John Paul II, in 2003, in uh, his work, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, Eucharistia which is um, the Eucharist and the Church, he wrote this. Proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes entails that all who take part in the Eucharist be committed to changing their lives and making them, in a certain way, completely Eucharistic. Wow, look at that. How do we make our lives completely Eucharistic? Like beginning to end, 24-7. In other words, how do we live the Eucharistic life, the Eucharistic pattern, in good times and in bad? That's what I want to look at. Philippians 3.10, St. Paul says this. I wish to know Christ and the power flowing from his resurrection. So when you hear that, you should think his resurrected body. Likewise, to know how to share in his sufferings by being formed into the pattern of his death. Now notice there's a very particular pattern here. Before we can experience and participate in his glorified body, what do we have to walk through first? Yeah, yeah. yeah. ouch, his passion. We have to be conformed to the likeness of his death. That's tough. That's tough. St. Paul goes on to say, he will give a new form to this lowly body of ours and remake it according to the pattern of his glorified body. This is what I like to think of as the Eucharistic pattern. His glorified body, which is chosen, blessed, broken, and given. So I'm drawing from a book by Father Henry Nowen entitled Life of the Beloved. And here's what he says in this book. Anyone read that book? Yes. It's a beautiful book. He says, to identify the movement of the Spirit in our lives, I have found it helpful to use four words. 
taken, and he interchanges that with chosen. So I like to use chosen. Chosen, blessed, broken, and given. These words also summarize my life as a Christian. Because as a Christian, I am called to become bread for the world. We could say I'm called to become Eucharist for the world. To make our lives completely Eucharistic. To become bread for the world. Bread that is taken, blessed, broken, and given. In every moment of my life, somewhere, somehow, the taking, the blessing, the breaking, and the giving are happening. The taking, or the choosing, the blessing, the breaking, and the giving are happening. That's the Eucharistic pattern. So how does this play out in our lives? Okay, first of all, being chosen. What does it mean to be chosen? Well, think of Miss America. Okay, I know it's not so common anymore. But we could think of The Voice, right? Or Britain's Got Talent. They're all about being chosen, aren't they? Think about the person who's the winner is no longer just one of the crowd, but selected from the crowd. Okay, maybe you're not really into Miss America, okay, or The Voice. But we have other experiences of this. For instance, when someone is in a play, so a friend of mine, her son is in seventh grade and he just tried out for Beauty and the Beast, and like keeps waiting, waiting, waiting. Was he chosen? And yes, he was chosen. He's gonna be Cogsworth, right? The clock. Such an exciting moment, because he was chosen. Or MVP, right? We all are like, okay, who's gonna be MVP of the Super Bowl? or MVP of the World Series. Like that's a really big deal because that person is distinguished. They're chosen from the rest. Or in prom court, or prom king and queen, right? It's a big deal to be chosen for homecoming or for prom. But you know what? In God's <coughs> eyes, you're not just one of the crowd. When he looks down on this earth, how many are we, seven billion by now? I, I lose count, so I don't have that many fingers. <coughs> He doesn't just see a crowd of people. He looks down. He sees you. You are selected from the crowd. That means you are chosen. Jesus also experienced this reality of being chosen. Anyone remember? Where is it that we hear Jesus is the beloved of the Father? The baptism, we're going to celebrate it soon. Right? The heavens open, and a voice says, this is my beloved. This is my chosen, my anointed one. At your baptism, even though you couldn't hear it, <laughs> the heavens open. And when you were baptized, God the Father said to all the heavenly court, look, look, look. There's my daughter. She's chosen. There's my beloved. This is my beloved. And what's the next part? In whom I am well pleased. Those are the foundational words of your life. So for those of you who bought my book, Discovering the Feminine Genius, that's the first chapter. First a daughter, then a bride. You are my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. At your baptism, had you done something to already earn or deserve that belovedness? No. Not if you were an infant. Pretty hard, huh? <laughs> Here's what Father Nowen says. When I know that I am chosen, I know that I have been seen as someone, as a special person. Someone has noticed me in my uniqueness and has expressed a desire to know me, to come closer to me, to love me. Okay, look around at the ladies at your table. Do you all look the same? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. I wish you could stand up here and look at all of your beaming faces and all the different shapes of your body and the color of your hair and the clothes that you're wearing. You see, to be the beloved, to be chosen means you know in your bones that you, someone has looked at you and cherished you as unique, as who you are. So, oh, this is who we are, isn't this great? The Father has noticed you in your uniqueness. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die. Remember 1 Corinthians 6.19? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die upon the cross. Why? To send his Holy Spirit upon you so you can know you are the beloved. That's your foundational identity. I like to say, like, 
I recently started listening again to contemporary Christian music. I've been listening only to Spanish music for, I don't know, six, seven years. So I finally switched back to English, and I began noticing, like, all the songs about, are about being broken. And it hit me one day. Is our foundational identity being broken and then beloved? Or is it being beloved and then experiencing brokenness? Makes a really big difference. Because notice what comes first in the Eucharistic pattern. Being chosen. Being beloved. So often, though, we think that we have to be the most talented, we have to be the prettiest, we have to be the most successful in order to be chosen. Right? We live in a world of competition. And I like to say men compete, women compare. Look, you did it when you walked in. You looked at other women and you compared. Some of you compared yourself to me and said, oh my gosh, she's so skinny. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'll admit it. I'm an athlete. I, you know, I demand. An athlete, whoops, sorry, an athlete with tiny ears. <laughs> I demand a lot from my body. But we just kind of, it's like our default. We compare. And then we think God compares. Is that what he's doing up there in heaven for all eternity? <laughs> Comparing all of you? Oh my gosh, how exhausting. We think we have to be the holiest, and then God will love us. Here's the great news. You can't earn being the beloved. And it's great news because if you can't earn it, then you can't lose it. You see, God's gift from all eternity is seeing you as the beloved. Can't earn it or deserve it also can't lose it. It's a gift. When I was in Canada a number of years ago, I heard a priest give a homily, and he said this line, and it just penetrated into my heart. He said, the beloved has nothing to prove. Can you imagine how alive we would be as women if we lived this? Mm -hmm. That we don't have anything to prove? Oh my gosh, we would take the world by storm. Because we're able to rejoice in who we are as the beloved, as God has chosen us. Then a little while later, I listened to a talk by a woman named Mary Nieberg, and she said, Jesus didn't notice performance, he noticed persons. I really like that. Jesus didn't notice performance, he noticed persons. Here are a couple of examples. The woman caught in adultery. Do you remember the story? The scripture says they found a woman in the very act of adultery. Can you imagine how humiliating? How shame producing? And they drag her out and they bring her before Jesus and they stand her before Jesus. And they say, look, this woman was caught in the very act of, of adultery. The law says, Moses said, we should stone her. What do you say? Right? They're trying to test him. And what does Jesus do? Does he say, yeah, stone her? What does he do? He bends down. He writes on the ground with his finger. I've thought so many times. Why? Like, that's such an odd detail, isn't it? Until then, until we remember how often in the Old Testament it talks about the finger of God. It's a reference, I think, to Jesus being divine. This is the way God looks at us. He's not just a rabbi. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a good moral man. He's God. So he stands up and he says, you know, story, let the first among you without sin cast the stone. Let, the, let those among you without sin be the first to cast the stone. And they walk away beginning with the oldest. oldest. And then Jesus is there. God is there with this woman drenched in shame. And what does he say to her? Woman, where are your accusers? They're none. Neither do I accuse you. Now go and sin no more. Do you see how he was restoring back her dignity to her? This is what God wants for us, to restore our dignity. And then there's Zacchaeus. Remember that short little guy? <laughs> he runs ahead, he climbs a sycamore tree. He's despised, a tax collector. And Jesus is walking along and he sees him. And he says, come down, Zacchaeus. I intend to eat at your house tonight. tonight. Can you imagine his joy at being chosen? Look, he was selected from all the crowd. And it brought salvation to his house. And then the parable of the prodigal son. Right? The father isn't 
Okay, ready to start. Where's my son? He's watching, waiting. And then when he sees him at a distance, what does he do? Does he go get the belt to whip him when he comes home? He runs to meet him. That father is an image of God the Father. He runs to meet him. Why? Because he welcomed him back into the family, not because of his performance, because his performance was a negative 10. <laughs> he welcomes him back, not because of his performance, but his person. Right? God, Jesus loves us not for a performance, but for a person. Okay, my favorite story, and perhaps yours in the Gospels about this, Martha and Mary. Yes. Right? Martha. How many of us are Marthas, right? <laughs> Cooking, cleaning, getting everything ready, and where's Mary? <laughs> Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Do you know that that's a reference to discipleship? That that's what a disciple did. A disciple sat at the teacher's feet. So she is sitting. It's not like she's being passive. She's taking in God, the epiphany of God right before her. And Mary and Martha comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, Jesus, can't you see what I'm doing? Like I'm cooking, I'm cleaning, don't you care? And Mary's just sitting there. And what does he say? Martha, you're so right. Mary, get up. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. He says, Martha, Martha. Mary, how many of us could he say that to? Katrina, Katrina, you are worried and bothered by many things. But, and I'm going to put in the word ultimately, ultimately only one thing is important. What is it? That love relationship with Jesus Christ. And who does the initiative come from? Jesus. It comes from God. I once heard someone said, Christianity is different from all other religions because in all other religions, man goes searching for God. It's only in Christianity that God comes searching for man. Why? Because the Word became flesh. The Father ran out to greet his son. Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about many things, but only one is important, and Mary has chosen the better part. Not because she's passive. It's because she's in a position of love in relationship to her bridegroom to receive all that she can from him. So chosen, we're chosen, all of these people, Mary, Zacchaeus, the woman caught in adultery, the, the younger brother, they're chosen not because of their merit, but because the pure gift of God in Jesus Christ, because the beloved has nothing to prove. But we're not just chosen, we're blessed. Here's what Father Nowen says. It is not enough to be chosen. Fascinating, huh, when I first read that. We also need an ongoing blessing that allows us to hear in an, on, in an ever new way that we belong to a loving God who will never leave us alone. Isn't that consoling? Jesus in the Gospel of John says, I am never alone. The Father is with me. Oh my gosh. I wish I could just inscribe that in my heart. I read it, I repeat it to myself. Oh, maybe that can be your New Year's resolution. I'm never alone. The Father is with me. Jesus was never alone. But notice, we need an ongoing experience of being chosen. I heard a rather amusing story one time about a couple who'd been married for 44 years. One day, the woman was talking to a friend on the phone uh, in the kitchen. And she said to her friend, he hasn't told me in 44 years that he loves me. Well, her husband heard her comment. And when she came out of the kitchen, he said to her, I told you on our wedding night that I loved you and that if I ever changed my mind, I'd let you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's obvious, isn't it? It's not enough just to be told once that we're loved. So too, it's not enough just to experience once that we're the beloved, that we're chosen. Here's what I find fascinating, is that Jesus also experienced ongoing affirmation from his Father. Where did he hear a second time, you are my beloved son? At the transfiguration. Well, gosh, if Jesus needed to hear it more than once in his humanity, 
united to his divinity, then I certainly need to hear it thousands of times. Why do you think he went off by himself to pray? So he could hear the voice of blessing. You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. So too, Father Nowen says, the Eucharistic bread is not only chosen, it's, it's, uh, it's not only chosen, but it's also blessed. Right? Jesus took the bread, blessed it. This is the pattern for our lives. We need ongoing words of blessing. We need to hear that we are highly valued, that we are cherished. I don't know about you, but my goodness, when this happens in my life, it's amazing. Okay, we live in a desert. You know what it's like to see parched land and what happens when you put water on it? it soaks it up. We are, par we are famished, parched for affirmation. When was the last time you were blessed? Not for what you do, but who you are. That's a big difference. We know how to compliment people well. Oh, thank you so much for helping out at the woman's morning of reflection. You did such a great job with the food. Wonderful, we need compliments. But affirmations are, I so enjoyed being with you this morning. You are such a delight. Do you see how different that is? It's an affirmation of our very being. That's what it is to be blessed. When I realized the importance of blessing, I began blessing my son every night before he went to bed. What I would do, I used the blessing from number 624. We heard this recently in our liturgical readings. And so I used the blessing that God gave to Moses to give to Aaron to bless the people. And here's what I would do, is I would put my hand on his forehead. Well, it started down here, and then he grew. <laughs> I put my hand on my forehead, and I say, Michael, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance to you and grant you peace. That's a blessing. And then I would add, and, um, and, and may the Lord bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'd make the sign of the cross on his forehead. And then I'd say, and may you always know that you are a blessing. Because I wanted it etched deep within his, his being, his identity, that no matter what happened, that he would know that he was a blessing. There he is, right? <laughs> when he was in high school. He is, was a blessing, but didn't always make all the right choices. Yeah. So not only for him, but for me, that was really an important ritual. You are a blessing. So what I want you to do is turn to the woman next to you, stand up, and give her a big hug and say, you are a blessing. <laughs> give her a big blessing hug. You are a blessing. Is to become silent 
and listen to the voices that say, and listen to the voice, sorry, listen to the voice that says good things about me. Wow. We need to be silent in prayer. But I think our problem is we're afraid when we go to prayer, we're not going to hear the voice of blessing. We're afraid we're going to hear, you are no good. Oh my goodness, did you see how you treated that woman yesterday? Oh, you will never measure up. Oh, you think you're holy? You're really not so holy. Look at your imperfections. Da 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 da. Right? Shame, shame, shame. It just heaps on us. Those tapes run in our minds. And so, because we're afraid we will hear the voice of condemnation instead of the voice of blessing, Father Nowen says we go to prayer and this is what we do. We talk, 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 talk. <laughs> Ever done that? Talk, 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 talk. And here's what he says we need to do. Zip it. <laughs> we need to be quiet. So I'm going to offer you another challenge for the new year. It's called Seven Minutes of Silence. Set a timer so you're not having to look at your watch or your phone for seven minutes. And see if you can just sit in silence for seven minutes. I think it's a great practice. See if we can cultivate this ability to hear again the voice of blessing. He says that in the silence, we can learn to hear again the voice of blessing. I was at World Youth Day in Toronto 2002. Anyone else there at World Youth Day? Woohoo, another. Hey, great. John Paul II said something that I have heard so many people mention and repeat because I think it struck almost everyone who was there, you know, the hundreds and thousands of us. He said, we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures. We are the sum of the Father's love. You are not the sum of your weaknesses and failures. You are the sum of the Father's love. If I gave you a piece of paper and asked you to list all your defaults, could you do it? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> if I gave you piece of paper and asked you to list all the good things about you. Could you do it? Could you list the fact that you are the sum of the Father's love? Isn't it wonderful to think about that? Do you see Jesus writing on the ground with the finger of God? What does he want to write into your heart this year? But we've got to be in prayer. And we need to be silent in order to experience the finger of God in our lives. So I want you to just close your eyes for a minute and just say to yourself, I am the sum of the Father's love. I am not the sum of my weaknesses or failures or poor choices or even what's been done to me. I am the sum of the Father's love. I am chosen and I am blessed. I am the beloved. Okay, so we are, you can open your eyes, chosen, blessed, broken, and then, I'm sorry, chosen, blessed, and then broken. Darn it. Wouldn't it be so much better to be chosen, blessed, and then given? Who would go for that pattern? I would totally sign up for that one. But notice, that's not the Eucharistic pattern. So too, it's not the pattern of our lives. In good times and in bad. Or we could say in good times and in broken times. Right? We are chosen, blessed, and then broken. Father Nowen's book completely changed the way I understood brokenness because he wrote this. The way we are broken is as much an expression of our individuality as the way we are taken, in other words, chosen, and blessed. You see, the way I am broken tells you something unique about me. The way you are broken tells me something unique about you, even those of you on the way back. The reason I am a conference speaker today is not because of my great talents. It's not why God chose me and gave me a mission on Theology of Life. It's because of what? My brokenness. That's what my book, Discovering the Feminine Genius, is all about. It's about my story of brokenness to discover that I am gift. I 
had no idea to learn how to love this body. Okay, I might not yet put it on a 10, but I'm at least pushing that end of the scale of how much I love my body. You see, the way you are broken is directly linked to the way you are to be given. It tells me something unique about you. In our culture, we have a convention. When you meet someone for the first time, usually you ask them, so what do you do? OK, I mean, it's not, it, it's not superficial. It's just the way that we kind of break the ice. OK, imagine if when you met someone for the first time, you said, so tell me, how have you been broken? <laughs> right into the center of that person's life. You see, the way, uh, in my own life, so I was married when I was 19, and I was married for 10 years, and after 10 years, my marriage failed. And for me, it was the worst thing that could have ever happened in my life. I like to say I felt as if God uh, took my heart I'm sorry, I felt as if what happened was my identity was taken and placed on a table and smashed into a million pieces. I was completely fragmented by the ending of my marriage because my whole identity was wrapped up in being a human spouse and bride. But on my birthday that year, the Lord taught me something. He spoke to me. It was my 30th birthday. He said, you are first a daughter, then a bride. First a daughter, then a bride. This is why we need those moments of silence. So God can speak his truth into our lives, into our hearts, into our identity. You see, I didn't have the language there but then, but God was telling me, Katrina, you are chosen. Not for anything you have done, but because you are my daughter. And only after you know yourself as beloved of the Father can you really be a bride. Because otherwise you're looking to your spouse to fulfill all of your needs. And that's impossible. My value I learned through the very painful experience of being broken, so in good times and in bad, I learned that my value comes from my relationship with God. And it has become the rock, the rock on which my life is built. I don't care what happens. Let the storms come, right? Let the winds blow. I know that I know that I know who I am, that I am first a daughter, then a bride. And no one and nothing can take that away from me. Do you see what it means? To know that you're chosen and blessed even in the midst of your brokenness. You see, brokenness became the gateway to deeper union. The doorway which I had to walk through. Okay, if you're experiencing pain and brokenness, you can stand on this side of the doorway. You can refuse to walk through that door. And receive what's on the other side. The gift that is present in your brokenness of being able to say, God is good, all the time. even in the midst of the bad times and the brokenness. And yet this is the way our culture interprets brokenness, interprets a divorce, a lost job, a disability, that somehow this is a confirma confirmation that you're worthless, that you lack value. Even Jesus' disciples fell prey to this kind of thinking. In the Gospel of John, the disciples come to Jesus, and, and they bring a blind man, and they say, who sinned, this man or his parents? Right? They were convinced his brokenness was because of something bad they had done. And what does Jesus say? He says, neither. It was to let God's works show forth in him. It was to be an epiphany. It was to let the glory of God be revealed precisely through his brokenness. <clears throat> Father Nelwyn says, our brokenness is an opportunity to purify. Ouch, that hurts. But it purifies and, what's that word? Deepens. deepens the blessing that rests upon us. You want to deepen 
your heart knowledge, your absolute grounded rock identity and knowing that God loves you and you are chosen and blessed, then be willing to walk through the doorway of brokenness and allow it to deepen the blessing that rests upon you. This is why we need other people to buoy us up. That's my favorite image of who we are to other women. Okay, remember where I was born and raised? San Diego. Okay, so I saw lots of buoys over the course of my life. Right? A buoy of floats. And if you're drowning, you can grab onto the buoy. And what will it do? Lift you up. My sisters, that's who we are to each other. Other. We are buoys. Because when you're going through the purification, it's pretty hard to remember that God is deepening the blessing. And that sometimes your life has any value or worth. We need to remind each other. The blessing still rests upon you. You are still the beloved. Because what initially can seem like rejection is an invitation to deeper communion, a holy door to encounter the living and merciful Christ, even though it doesn't seem like mercy at the time. I want to give some Old Testament examples. Joseph, how he lived the Eucharistic path. Joseph was chosen, right? His father chose him and gave him the coat of many colors. And his brothers were so jealous, right? And he was chosen and he was blessed. His father continued to heap blessings upon him. But then what happened? Ouch, huh? His brothers threw him into a well and were intending to leave him there to die. And Reuben, the oldest brother, okay, had a little sense, knocked into him and said, no, 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 let's pull him out. So they pulled him out and they sold him to slave traders going on their way to Egypt. <clears throat> Chosen, blessed, broken. Can you imagine being sold into slavery by your own family, your own brothers? And then in Egypt, what happens? He's falsely accused. And he's thrown into prison. Okay, I could just imagine Joseph could have been sitting there in prison saying, oh, well, it's obvious God doesn't care about me. Look, you know, first my brothers throw me into a well. You know, then they pull me out. Then they sell me to slave traders. Then I get falsely accused, thrown in prison. Really, God, it's obviously you don't care about me. Or he could think, you know, I, I really did deserve this. Okay, after all, I did have those kind of prideful dreams, you know, of all the other sheaves bowing down to me. And, and I was kind of attached to that coat of many colors. Maybe I flaunted it once or I don't think those were his thoughts. Because I think what happened is in prison, God used that to purify the blessing that already rested upon Joseph. How can I say that? Because Joseph rose to be second in command in all of Egypt. You see, God uses brokenness not to smush them down in his weakness and worthlessness, but to affirm his belovedness. Abraham, another Old Testament example. Anyone remember how old, anyone remember how old Abraham was when he received the promise? He was 75. Right? Yeah, really, God? you got to be kidding me. Do you remember what happened when the visitors told him that this time next year he would have a son and Sarah was listening? What did she do? Laugh. She laughed. <laughs> Why? Because it was impossible. you got to be kidding. What happened the next year? They were holding a son. Anyone know how old Abraham was by the time... Isaac was born. So he received the promise at 75. But how old was he when Isaac was born? He was 100 years old. Okay, I'm not very good in math, but even I can figure out without my cell phone, okay, that that's 25 long years of being broken, of waiting, waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. But think about it. Don't you think when Sarah was pregnant and then when Isaac was born, it was a bit obvious that God had something to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> do you see how the brokenness led to an epiphany? It led to a visible manifestation of God in the flesh, in the birth of Isaac. It was to let God's work shine forth through him, through Abraham,
Abraham, through Sarah, through Isaac, the child of the pro promise. You see, it was, it, it was particularly in the brokenness that God could shine through. And then Ruth. So, I mean, I have to get a woman example, right? I can't only do men here among women. Ruth was a Moabite, which meant, excuse me, which meant she lived in Moab. And one day, Naomi, a Jew, moves into town because there's a famine in Israel. And she hears there's food in Moab. So she moves to Moab, and guess who is chosen and blessed to marry one of Naomi's sons? Ruth. Wow, can you imagine how wonderful it must have felt to be chosen and blessed to be one of Naomi's sons' wives? But then what happens? Right. Naomi's husband dies. One son dies. The other son's die. other son dies. And there they are. And Ruth is left. Sorry. She is left poor, childless, husbandless. She's broken. Na uh, Naomi comes to her. I have to get my names right here. Naomi comes to her and says, look, I'm going back to my people in Israel. You stay here with your people. Okay, if I'd been Ruth, I would have said hasta la vista, right? <laughs> I just cut my losses and, you know, tried to take advantage of the present situation. But she doesn't. You see, after Naomi's husband dies, and Ruth's husband dies, and the other son dies, Ruth doesn't build a... What, what, she doesn't entrench herself there. Instead, she says to Naomi, no, no. I'm going with you. And we have some of the most beautiful verses in all the Old Testament, which is often used at weddings, but it's actually one younger woman, we could say to her older mentor woman, wherever you go, I will go. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Is she living out of her brokenness or out of her belovedness in that moment? Out of her belovedness, you see? So what happens? They go back to Israel, and Ruth is a widow, she's childless, she's poor, and she's a foreigner. How do we know that? Because the scriptures tell us she gleans the fields. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had to glean a field. Blessed be God forever. <laughs> <laughs> but gleaning the field means the harvesters go through, and they leave crumbs, grain, kernels behind. So that the poorest of the poor can come in and somehow sustain themselves. I think our modern equivalent would be dumpster diving. You've seen the people scrounging through trash cans and dumpsters. That's Ruth. She's poor. She's a foreigner. She's a widow. She's childless. She is broken. Tell me, is that the end of the pattern? It would be such a bummer, wouldn't it, if I said, thank you very much, let's go have lunch. You're like, I have no stomach for lunch. Unless it's chocolate. It's not the end of the Eucharistic pattern. We're not only chosen, blessed, broken, we are given. Given. Because our brokenness allows us to be given in our particular way. Joseph's brokenness was up allowed him to be given a second in command. In all of Egypt, God was purifying, purifying, purifying him for leadership position. Lo I'm sorry, Abraham's brokenness allowed him to be given as the father of all nations. He's our father in faith. Not because of his merit or his accomplishments, it's because of his brokenness. And Ruth, does anyone know who Ruth became? She's the mother of the father of King David. In other words, she's King David's great-grandmother. Imagine if she'd stayed in Moab. Oh, that's a problem. <laughs> because who is Jesus descended from? David. The line of David. This is what she's mentioned. Remember that boring reading we have in Advent where we have the genealogy yes. of Jesus? <laughs> Next time, I want you to sit up and prick open your ears 
and listen to the four women that are mentioned in that genealogy. One of them is a prostitute, Rahab. The, uh, one of them is Ruth, a foreigner. And the other is King David's wife. Amazing. God is good all, all the, time. the time. Even when it looks like everything is broken. And Mary. Right? Today's Mary in theology of the body. Mary lived the Eucharistic pattern. She was chosen. Chosen among women to bear the Son of God. She was blessed. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. She was broken, and a sword shall pierce your heart. And then she was given. Given at the foot of the cross to be our mother in faith. You see, the way she was given is directly linked to how she was chosen, blessed, and broken. The way, the unique way you have been broken is directly linked to the unique way that you can be given. May I just say that again? The unique way that you have been broken is directly linked to the unique way that you can be given. No one can be given in exactly the same way that you can. Why? Because no one has been broken in exactly the same way. Toward the end of the book of Life of the Beloved, Father Nolan reflects on Leonard Bernstein's musical work entitled The Mass, which was written in memory of John F. Kennedy. I'm sure some of you remember the moment when Kennedy was shot. Right? For me, for my generation, uh, for me what the equivalent is, is I remember the moment when I heard the news that John Paul II died. For me, that moment is forever, again, embedded in my memory. So in this musical work, entitled The Mass, uh, there is a priest who's dressed in splendid liturgical vestments. And he's being carried high on a, on a pyramid of his adoring um, parishioners. And he has in his hands a beautiful glass chalice. And all of a sudden, the pyramid of people collapses. And the priest falls. And the, the chalice, the glass chalice, is scattered, no longer looks beautiful, does it, when that pyramid collapses. And a few scenes later, the priest is walking now through jeans and a t uh, he's walking in jeans and a t-shirt, barefoot, through the debris of his former glory. And he sees the broken chalice. And he says, I never realized that broken glass could shine so brightly. I never realized that broken glass could shine so brightly. Why, does God, why was the man born blind? To let God's glory shine through. Why, does pain, why was Jesus crucified on the cross? We'd say he thought he won. It wasn't defeat, it was a victory. What are we saved by? The body of Christ. It was to be an epiphany of God, to let God's glory shine through. Why do you experience brokenness and pain and suffering in your life? Is it to smush you down in your weakness? No, it's just the opposite. It's to let God's glory shine through so that God can shine through you, through your body, through your broken body with a light that doesn't come from you. It's so obvious that it comes from the Eucharistic pattern being inscribed into your life. So what's the challenge as we leave here today? The challenge is to become Eucharist in the world. When? All the time. All the time. <laughs> in good times and in bad. In good times and in our brokenness. To open wide. Remember that's what John Paul II said. Open wide the door of your heart to Christ. Open wide the door of our lives. No matter how broken. To an encounter with the living Christ. With his living body. So to go to prayer and say, Thank you, Lord, that I'm chosen. 
that I am your daughter, that you love me, that you have selected me, that you love my person, not my performance. Thank you, Lord, that I am blessed among women, that when I come into your presence, I hear words of blessing, not words of condemnation or shame. Thank you, Father, that I am not the sum of my weaknesses and failures, but the sum of your love. Help me to always know that I am a blessing, even when I don't feel like it. Thank you, Lord. This is a hard one, isn't it? That I am broken. Thank you for all the times when life didn't go my way. Thank you for all the saints and examples in the Bible of people who were broken. And so let God's glory shine through. Help me to let your glory shine through my brokenness. Help me to let your glory shine through my brokenness. And then finally, thank you. Thank you that the Eucharistic pattern doesn't end there. Thank you that I am given. Thank you that the way I am broken is directly linked to the way I am given, to my family, to my friends, to the church, to the world. Help me to be given more. Help me to hold nothing back. And here's the really difficult prayer. Help me to be willing to be broken more so that I can be given more. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I give you permission to take me, to bless me. Yes, to break me and to give me as Eucharist to the world. Do you see when you do that, there is nothing that Satan can hold on you. Nothing. Because excuse the expression, but you have spit in his face. Remember in Wizard of Oz what happens when they pour the water on the Wicked Witch of the West? She melts and disappears. You have the power for saying to melt and disappear before you by saying, Lord, I give you permission. Take me, bless me, yes, even break me, and give me as Eucharist to the world. And then this way, when we go to Mass and we hear the words of consecration, the priest says, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body given up for you. And you can be there, sorry, in, whoops, in the pew saying, yes, yes, Lord, let it be me. Let me be Eucharist in the world. I join myself to the bread and wine as it goes forward to be changed into Eucharist for the world. <coughs> May it be so. May it be done unto us according to God's word. Amen. 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 And may we live our seven minutes of silence. <laughs> so that we can hear the voice of blessing. Thank you so much. God bless you. Okay, so uh, Viv asked about cremation. That's probably mm, the most common question that I get, and especially depending on the age group, it can be like a deep burning question. So what about cremation, given everything we talked about? So thanks so much for asking that. As many of you may be aware, is up until uh, sometime in the early 60s, if you were Catholic, it was forbidden for, to be cremated. And what was the reason behind that? It was because up until that point, crema cremation by some philosophical and religious systems was a statement that there was no afterlife for the body after death. So if you think about um, religions that believe in reincarnation, uh, they cremate the body. Because for them, the body is a temporary uh, tool or a temporary expression that the soul uses during that life. But then, once they die, the, the usage of the body is over. And so that's why the body is cremated, because the soul then, it's the soul that is eternal, not the body. In another talk, I meant, I specifically say, you have an eternal relationship with your body. That, that's really phenomenal. 
But if you believe in reincarnation, that's not the case. Or if you believe that there's nothing after death, that's not the case. So up until the 1960s, if a body was cremated, that was a cultural statement that there was no afterlife for the body. Its usage was over. That's why the church forbade it. I don't know what changed culturally worldwide in the early 60s, but something obviously changed. And the church permitted cremation um, for, uh, for Catholics. But there are some qualifications in the sense that if someone is cremated, those ashes must be reposed, just as you would repose a body. In other words, grandma cannot sit up on the mantle. Neither should she be tucked away in a closet. <laughs> we are also not permitted to scatter the ashes. Why? Because those ashes represent the body of a person. And so th this is what I think we've lost, is the fact that we must still treat those ashes as sacred, and they must be reposed accordingly. I think, though, our understanding of theology of the body and this great gift of the body invites us to reconsider cremation. I know that I personally um, have requested that at my mass of resurrection, right, that my body be there and that it be buried in a wedding dress. Because I want everyone to know, you know, I reached it, right? <laughs> that I'm going to, my bridegroom came for me. And, and he came, you know, he came for me, and I want everyone to know that. I was like, no black, at, you know, no. my mass of resurrection. Wear all the bright colors that you can. It's, it's my wedding day, my, my spiritual, eternal wedding day. So I think that it invites us to reconsider how we celebrate uh, someone's passing into eternity. So I saw a hand back there. Yes? Okay, so what, what, what's my response to that? So she said she runs across many Catholics who, some Catholics who believe that we are not permitted to be organ donors. Uh, what do I say to that? Um, there is nothing morally objectionable to being an organ donor. That's very important to say. That that is a morally permissible thing to do. <clears throat> the problem that now has occurred is that in the way that medicine is currently practiced, Unfortunately, there are times, and sometimes not a few, in which the organs are harvested from the person before the person is actually dead. Oh. We need to be aware and to know that. So that would be why, for instance, I do not have an organ donation on my driver's license a permission. I don't have that permission for that reason. It's not that I wouldn't want someone to receive my organs. It's that I don't want them to kill me <laughs> so that they can take my organs. So that is the problem. So that's why sometimes these issues are nuanced. Um, in the back there. Uh huh. Yes. in terms of when we die, are we resurrected in the bodies that we had here on this earth, or is it a different body? The answer is yes. <laughs> it's both. Because what we always have to remember is it's a glorified, perfected body. So if you know someone who's lost an arm, or maybe they're blind, or for instance, all the babies that have been tragically lost through abortion, Right? Any person that has ever been conceived, because a person's a person, no matter how small, any person who's ever been conceived, God willing, will be in heaven, and when Christ comes back again, will receive their glorified body. So what their body would be had it been perfected. 
What does the glorified body look like? This is why I say the only thing we know are the resurrection accounts of Christ. And we see that it was the same body, and yet it was a different body. How do we know it was the same body? The wound marks. That tells us the wounds in his hands and his side. That tells us it was the same body that went into the grave is the same body that was raised. But you're like, yeah, but bodies disintegrate. It's true. I mean, if people ask, what about people who cremated, you know, and their ashes have been scattered? Well, what about people who lived 3,000 years ago? Right? Their bodies have decomposed. Do you see, this is why it is an element of faith. Not because we figured it out rationally, but because God revealed it. And so we say we believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. Because it is a revelation of God through Christ's glorified and raised bodies. So remember, that's one of the reasons why I decided to quote 1 Corinthians 15, because it has that word in there. It's a mystery. Which means we can say some things about it, but we, can't, we, but we don't know fully about it. So at a certain point, we just have to do this. Because it's really dangerous territory, we can easily step into heresy. So what we do know is it will be the same body. It will be different in the sense that it's a glorified and perfected body. That's the promise. Yes? Are you saying that that's the body once uh, in when Christ comes again. When Christ comes again. So what's in the meat? Yeah, this was the question that someone asked me. That's the other question that's most commonly asked. Okay, so what about all the souls who are hanging out in heaven right now, right? What about them? Because a soul is not a person. Do you see? That's an artificial state. That's a problem. In my opinion, this is the most difficult question, period, in all of theology. This is the most difficult question. Because how you answer it has incredible implications. So I'm going to give two proposals. Um, because again, we have to just, we have to propose. I think the most, the easiest thing that we can say is that remember, eternity is not time. That's why we call it eternity. Eternity is, a lot of people refer to it as being outside of time. Or we can say it's the fullness of time. That means you have to ask, what is time? Time means we experience things sequentially. When I gave my first talk this morning, did you hear it all at once? No, you had to sit there in your chairs, like waiting for the next word, and the next word, and the next PowerPoint picture. And you see, you experience, we experience our lives in time, meaning we experience them sequentially. That's not what eternity is. Eternity is the fullness of time. We say it's it's an eternal now. Everything at once. How does that work? I have no idea. Because <laughs> I haven't been there. We, we only have our experience in time. So what that means, though, is that the souls in eternity are not up there going, okay, God the Father, when are you sending Jesus Christ back? Isn't it about time for the second coming? Look, it's been 2,000 years. <laughs> Because they don't have this experience of sequential. So I think that's the first thing, is it's not like they experience waiting. Because waiting means time. In heaven, there is no past and no future. Waiting means future. There's only the eternal now. So I think that that is the easiest way to answer that question, is that it's just a now. The other way to answer it is a little bit more complicated. Um, but it has to do with our baptism. In our baptism, there are three things that happen. We are cleansed of the effects of original sin. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within. And we are incorporated into the body of Christ. We often don't hear about the third one, but it's absolutely significant. In other words, you're united to the body of Christ. This is why Paul in Romans 12 says, And you, you are the body of Christ. Why? By baptism. Because you've been united to the body of Christ. So you please, you just tell me, does it make sense to you if during this whole life, as we journey through time, we're united to the body of Christ, that when we die and our soul is separated from our bodies and we enter into Christ's presence, that we would be separated from his body? Does that make sense to you? 
So Father Jose Granados brilliantly proposes that in heaven we are united to the body of Christ, the glorified body of Christ, as we were here on earth, but in a temporal manner. Now, in an eternal manner, we can be united to his glorified body, participating in his glorified body. So there's never a time when you have a soul without a body in heaven. Isn't that brilliant? And then, then when your, your own body, when Christ comes back, is raised and glorified, you're united to your glorified body. And guess what? That glorified body is united to the glorified body of Christ, but that's another talk. Okay. <laughs> but that's what really gets me going. Um, this is why it's so important to think about heaven. It, because, because how we understand heaven influences profoundly how we live our lives here on earth. 